Welcome to another exciting episode of Mission Compliance, Unleashing Growth Potential for Defense Contractors. And today we have an episode that promises to shed light on a critical aspect of securing your organization. Picture this. Your organization operates in an environment where cybersecurity threats are as common as the air we breathe. You know that compliance with DFARS, NIST SP-800-171, and CMMC are essential, but how do they interface with your overall IT strategy? That's the puzzle we're here to solve today. So grab your cyber magnifying glass and join us as we unravel the mysteries of how your compliance strategies intersect with your broader IT roadmap. We'll bring you expert insights, practical tips, and real-world examples that will not only help you stay compliant, but also supercharge your organization's IT strategy for the digital age. You know what's next. We're joined once again today by Mike Frieder, President of On Call Compliance Solutions and a CMMC Professional Assessor. So Mike, today we're talking about compliance and IT, specifically how compliance with DFARS, NIST, and CMMC might fit into a business's overall strategy. Before we get into that, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing awesome. I'm doing awesome, Remy. Yeah, this is a, a topic that I think um, is is near and dear to our heart. We're, we're sort of dealing with some of these issues uh, in the past week or two with uh, one of our clients. And I'll kind of give you, I'll, I'll give you what the scenario is. Um, and, and it came to, this thing happened and it brought to light a very interesting conversation that we have all the time with IT directors, but it also brought to light the idea that a lot of people don't really understand the effect that compliance has on IT departments. And so we, you know, we thought we would um, kind of talk a little bit about that. And so here's sort of the here's sort of the scenario. We were we were about to fly out and go to one of our clients. And they called us up and they said, hey, we're delayed because we just lost our IT guy. You know, the guy put in his notice, he's history, he's out of there. And, you know, we said, okay, well, we totally get it. It's not like that relieves you of your legal liability to be compliant. And I look at this as a huge opportunity. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, to me, if you can start with a blank slate and you haven't hired someone yet, and you're trying to get compliant, have us come in, we'll show you how to get compliant, we'll figure out where the deficiencies are. And then we're gonna tell you what solutions can solve those deficiencies. And then you can hire someone who has that skill set. And then that led to this other conversation of, you know, at the end of the day, why do you get compliant? You get compliant so you can close a sale, right? Because you have to in order to win the business. Uh, or you want to grow your defense-oriented businesses, right? So you, you want to expand your footprint in defense. Either way, what really happens is the government is dictating how IT and security need to run in your organization. So, you know, this sort of epiphany that we had together on the phone was, you know, it's compliance is the tail that wags the dog. So hopefully you've got IT people on staff that can do this, and if not, you outsource. But the reality is, if you're in that position, if you either have, you know, a weak IT department or it needs to grow or there's some issue in IT and you, or, and maybe they lack direction, maybe they don't. And, and by the way, we have medical clients that call us all the time. They go, Hey, listen, our IT department sat down. They've decided that the right way to do security here is to use the NIST SP-800-171 framework, because if it works and is good enough for DOD contractors, it'll work for our hospital. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Hey, you know what? It's the same. It's the same exact thought process that we had and that we used to secure over a thousand different businesses that we manage technology for who are from all kinds of industries. And yeah, we primarily focus on defense, but we've got everybody from hospitals to car dealerships to attorneys to law, you know, major law offices. You name it, we manage technology for it. And I think, you know, that that's really like the critical piece there is that understanding that this is an incredible framework for security and the framework for security and how IT should be running and how risk should be managed in IT, that should dictate how your IT department operates. Your IT department should not just be making this stuff up as you go along. And this is, I think, one of the biggest business problems ever to be solved. 
You hire an IT guy, you really have no idea what his skill set is, and worse, you have no real idea what they should actually be doing as far as the job of securing your IT infrastructure. There's just no direction there. NIST SP800171 grants that direction, explains to everybody at the table, you know, the people who have to manage the IT group, the IT group, IT group subordinates, everybody has a really clear game plan of what needs to be done, what a finished product looks like, when you're secure and you can sleep good at night, and when you're not okay, and when you've got work to do through a plan of action with milestones. It's just such a brilliant way to operate. I love it. Um, and, and again, I think it's just something, it's a great topic that I just kind of felt like we should really get out there because there are so many people who look at this and they don't know what to make of it. And, and I look at it and I go, this is, this is like your playbook, right? This is, this should be dictating how IT operates, how you evaluate the IT in your business, how uh, IT secures things, how the organization from an organization wide perspective manages risk. Um, I mean, this is like half of operations, right? I mean, to be able to be handed this, uh, you know, from our government that has really done a great job of spending millions of dollars betting that this stuff works, it's incredible to me. So, yeah, no, you've already you've already touched on it a little bit, but feel free to to list off some others or to elaborate. But what are some key challenges that, are, that organizations might face when aligning DFARS, NIST, and CMMC compliance with their broader IT strategies? Man. I got the perfect answer for that because we just dealt with it yesterday and, and, and it's one word, culture, culture. Culture is such a challenge, particularly if you are a larger company who's been around a while, or if you are, it's for whatever reason, it seems that uh, if you're in the manufacturing business, um, it seems it's much harder to shift culture. A lot of long-term employees, fabricators, you name it, um, those people are difficult to sway. Here's the golden ticket. Are you ready? Uh, the golden ticket to this is that you have to understand that security and convenience are at polar opposite ends of the spectrum. It is far more convenient to have no security on a network and it's far less convenient to be properly secured. Thankfully, we are a few years removed from the introduction of the concept of multi-factor authentication. People understand that they have to have it. They don't like it. But they understand it and they and they're and they're tolerant to it. Three years ago, that was not the case. Three years ago, there were a lot more hacks than there are now. Um, I think that ultimately, at the end of the day, what can you do about the fact that people don't want to get with this because it creates inconvenience in their lives? The answer is force them. Sorry, there's just no way, there's no easier way to do it. This is mandated by law. It's the perfect excuse to have proper security in place. I couldn't dream up a better scenario if I wanted to, right? Uh, you got the United States federal government and DOD telling you you have to do this. So with that in mind, you know, the first thing to understand is uh, a lot of people talk to me about culture and shifting the culture and things like that. Here's a really cool fact. My wife happens to have a PhD in organizational behavior, which is primarily focused on the culture of businesses and how they act. So I get to get some really neat industry insider first uh, first person information on how to do this. And then on top of that, obviously, we're helping our clients to change their culture. I will tell you that at the end of the day, culture comes from the top down. You can't have a CEO who doesn't believe in something, who is then turning around and not acting in a certain way and expect your subordinates to do that. It has to be from the top. The executives must understand that not implementing this is both illegal and is extremely risky to your whole business. Okay. If they don't understand that, you know what? Get out of the defense industry. Like, I'm sorry, but you know, again, we have this graphic that we show people of what a Chinese J-30 something fighter is uh, looks like. It's an exact ripoff of our F-35. It's really insulting. I mean, it's, they're not even trying to hide it. You look at a Chinese Humvee, it looks like a Humvee. There's no feng shui design there, right? Like it's, you know, it's it's straight up a ripoff of America because they can't figure out how to engineer it on their own. And, you know, and then they go make improvements from there where they can, which is even tougher to deal with as a military. If, if you're going to sit here and put military related information at risk because you're just, you know, asinine and don't want to follow these strategies, go serve the private sector that doesn't have these kinds of regulations. Just get out. You know, I'm sorry. It's just it's that simple. Um, second, so leaders have to take a hard line on this and they have to take it seriously. The benefit to taking it seriously is a translation down to your sales teams and to your production teams. 
your sales teams are going to massively benefit from leveraging compliance as a competitive selling proposition. I talk about that all the time. But that's got to come from the leaders in the company. Trust me, your salespeople are like little six-year-old kids. They look at you and you are the example. You are the parent. And if you're not behaving, they're not going to behave. If you're behaving and you're disciplined, they're going to be disciplined and behave too or else they'll get out. Same thing on the production team. Your production team will work better and they will work harder and they will work faster when they know that what they're doing is related to keeping their country safe. They will have a pride that they lay down on a pillow with and go to bed with at night and wake up with in the morning. That is a pride of serving our country and being a defense contractor. And they may not have realized that that's part of what they do. But the second that you can inject that, all the little stuff like having to deal with multi-factor authentication just goes away because you finally gave them the why. So man, yeah, a great, phenomenal question because we deal with that in every large client that we deal with. How do I shift the culture? How do I successfully roll this out? And the answer is number one, it's gotta be top down. Number two is it's gotta be a team approach. Number three, you gotta do the training. You gotta do the training. Uh, there's some simple mandatory trainings that come along with this. Uh, you need to do them. You need to hold people accountable. You need to roll call. You need to get certificates from people. They pass the training. Uh, again, the DOD delivers all of this for free. That's the best part of this. So uh, great, great question, Roman. Uh, glad, glad you asked that. Absolutely. This is a this is a uh, deep well of a topic. So let's let's continue pushing forward. Excuse me. In uh, in previous episodes, we talked about how compliance officers and IT professionals are not the same thing. They they don't necessarily have the same responsibilities. A compliance officer is a specific position, but sometimes in a smaller company. They may not have the benefit of having a dedicated compliance officer. Sometimes the IT department might might have to take on some of those responsibilities, whatever. So, and you already mentioned this a little bit. You already talked about benefits a little bit. But what are the potential benefits of aligning compliance efforts with broader IT goals? And, and, and how does this alignment contribute to enhanced cybersecurity? Yeah, we did touch on that a little bit. But you know what? Let me, let me dive into the specifics of that question. Number one is... Um, Believe it or not, in my opinion, the first thing that comes to mind is actually cost savings. So many IT departments roll out a new solution after a lot of planning and a lot of effort to get it underway, only to wind up finding out that that's not the right solution six months or a year or two years later. Um, I think that with NIST, you get a complete framework for how things should operate. And when you take this on holistically, and it's a big bite to take out, right? It's a big animal to take on. Um, but when you do it from a holistic approach, you're going to have everything figured out up front. It's going to be cohesive. Everything's thought out and you will wind up ultimately saving a tremendous amount of money by doing it right the first time. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, second thing that comes to mind is, is that you will create a true layered security approach. Um, IT companies today cannot just take their antivirus and think that's enough. Firewall think that's enough. I love a layered approach. In fact, I love a layered approach so much. We've had situations where we've had attackers get through one or two layers of our security and thwarted or isolated at other layers. You just can't, there's no such thing as 100% security. There is nothing. CrowdStrike, you know, uh, Fortigate, like Juniper Networks, there are attacks on all of them, okay, that succeed. So you have to have a layered approach I think that you know the NIST SP800171 compliance standard does a tremendous job of laying out that layered approach. And uh, again, you've just got to make sure that you have those multiple layers and that they're monitored. And I think that's a huge, huge thing that is dictated by NIST and is a directive the department, the, the IT department just has to follow. Um, but again, letting the IT department dictate what security should be without knowledge of how the whole picture needs to look is just really going to be devastating to the long-term complete time to roll out. It'll take longer to roll it all out. And then of course, you're going to spend more money fixing mistakes later because you didn't know that a certain piece had to be there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you're talking about IT, when you're talking about compliance, technology comes into play a lot. A lot of the controls deal with properly handling technology. IT deals with fixing technology, fixing broken technology, fixing it, the, the the internet, that kind of thing. So 
Technology is constantly changing, which means that cybersecurity threats are becoming more diverse and complex. So how can organizations stay agile and adaptive in the face of evolving compliance regulations while maintaining a robust IT strategy? Great question. Um, I think number one is vendor support, right? So choose your vendor carefully. Uh, your vendors are vendors that should be known in the space. They should have probably government type solutions. Great example is Microsoft. Microsoft has government specific solutions. Uh, if you're going to be a defense specific company or do defense specific work that carries its own requirements, work with vendors like on call or like Microsoft who are specific to the defense industry. They're going to have the most up-to-date real-time threat protection that you can have. Um, second thing is, you know, that is the job of a, of a virtual compliance officer or a compliance officer. If you can't afford a whole new person in your organization as a compliance officer, talk to us. We can do that. We can do that as a virtual service for a few hours a month. And it, it's an incredible service. Uh, our people are in the face of those people who write these standards, who uh, are, are delving you know, into the business and things like that. Um, you know, we are a company who on a daily basis is up to date on what's going on and because it, that's what our bread and butter is. You know, again, if you're a manufacturing company, you're going to know what the latest techniques in manufacturing are. We know all the latest stuff when it comes to compliance. There's also numerous email lists. Uh, I would encourage you reach out to us uh, if you want some help with this. And we have an amazing compliance tip Thursday that goes out every single Thursday. It's got compliance tips in it. Uh, and it's just got invaluable information that helps our clients to stay on top of the latest and greatest when it comes to compliance. So you have to look for resources like that, but man, they are sure out there. Uh, again, you can always sign up at our website. You can go visit uh, cmmccompliancesecrets.com. And uh, you know we're, we're, we are one of those services that are constantly on top of the changes. Absolutely. Plenty of resources out there. Check out our YouTube channel and, and we can help you there as well. That's right. uh, so, so here we go. Favorite time of the podcast, at least for me personally. Uh, we're continuing the theme of the last episode where we talk about superheroes. You have that you have that uh, shield behind you for the people that are watching on on uh, on YouTube. So so we're going to stay in that arena. Do compliance officers secretly have superhero capes hidden under their suits? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I'd, I'd be like, why hide it? Just wear it outside your suit jacket. Like, that's well, right. You, you know, I, I was, it, it, it reminds me, um, and I feel very fortunate, you know, we have like seven or eight teams of people here at On Call that go out and do this. And I mean, we're on airplanes every day flying out to people to swoop in, save their defense work, get them compliant, fly back out and um, you know, I'll tell you, I may not have a cape, but I'll tell you, I got a heck of a frequent flyer mile account uh, from going to see clients. And, you know, when we go in there, yeah, we accomplish the mission in terms of helping them to get compliant and things like that. But gosh, man, we, we accomplish so much else. You know, as a part of all of our consultations, we're doing an active internal risk assessment. A lot of companies we see have never done that. They have no idea about the risks that are sitting in their networks. We help them solve problems within their IT departments because that's inevitably going to come up. They're going to share their challenges with us. And, you know, the people that we have doing this, uh, you know, it's not like we have really super seasoned people, um, you know, who are who are participating in these compliance consultations. It's no joke. I mean, the average person uh, with us has 20 plus years of cybersecurity and compliance experience. And you see a lot in 20 years and you get to understand a lot. So we're bringing best practices. We're bringing risk management skills. We're bringing tools with us to be able to look at these networks and see are there vulnerabilities that are active right now um you know and, and then on top of that boy you know we're really putting on the zero superhero cape when we're like hey look here's like 15 different ways that you can grow your business uh in the defense industry uh, frankly i just don't know very many consultants that pack that much value into just a handful of days and then you know, the biggest superhero power uh, that I think we really have, and I didn't think about this earlier when you asked the question is, uh, the biggest superhero power we have is the superpower of time warping. We take something that takes anyone else anywhere between six months and 24 months to do, and we pack it into two to three days, depending upon the size of your company, you know, and sometimes it gets a little bit longer than that if you've got multiple locations and whatnot, but um, I don't think anyone has it figured out like we do. And for sure, we literally warp time, definitely a superpower. It's something we're very proud of. 
And uh, you know what, that, that, that probably the time warp thing might be, might be particularly on my cape as well. So yeah, hundred percent, man, you know, that's, and this is why, you know, you look back at that poster behind, behind me and, you know, it's, you know, our, our motto internally here is, you know, we're ensuring compliance, we're making sure you've got it. And then we're driving growth because ultimately every organization that we works with grows by going through this process. And then, you know, the other big piece up there is, is obviously our compliance hero shield. You know, the people that work with us are absolute heroes. So maybe it's not us with the superhero cape. Maybe it's our clients. You know, these are folks that we're training to understand compliance. They're charged with the responsibility of keeping that company safe from cyber attack, helping the sales departments win more deals. I mean, man, that's a lot of hats to wear. And you know what? It's, I think really, Roman, I think the people who deserve the capes are our clients. Uh, you know, and again, we help out with our virtual compliance service, but, um, you know, the people inside these organizations who are our point of contacts, as far as I'm concerned, those are my heroes. I mean, those guys are the ones that are out there executing this every day. So, um, you know, we're super proud of our heroes and, uh, yeah, I think we definitely wear some hidden capes. Like, like you always tell me and our, and our listeners as well, we're, we're here to defend those who defend our country. So, those are the people that are the real heroes. Not all heroes wear capes. Some do. If it's almost Halloween, if you want to go get a cape, wear it on the outside of your clothes and we won't judge you. Uh, <laughs> but, but that wraps up a particularly informative episode of Mission Compliance. We hope our discussion today has provided you with valuable insights, practical strategies, and inspiration to navigate the ever-evolving world of defense. We'd like to thank Mike once again for joining us and packing this episode full of great information. Thanks, Mike. Hey, always a pleasure, Roman. But the conversation doesn't end here. We encourage you to continue exploring these topics and connect with us on social media uh, on our social media channels. Share your thoughts, ask questions, and engage with fellow listeners by using the hashtag Mission Compliance Podcast. If you haven't already, what should they do, Mike? Like, subscribe, and catch us on our YouTube channel this time. Yeah, that's right. Go to your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to that, and be the first to know when new episodes are all released. And we truly appreciate it if you could take a moment to rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us to continue to bring you thought-provoking episodes and high-quality content. Join us again on the next episode of Mission Compliance, where we jump back into the realm of compliance controls. And as we dive further into the into the dynamic world of defense, security, and industry innovation. Until then, take care, stay informed, and make compliance your mission. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.